Thanks for coming. Uh, this is going to be about social engineering, so I think it's it's be boring for most of you. So uh, I just hope that uh, I will tell you something you don't know yet. First, I don't know. Maybe I'm the first time here, so no one knows me. But usually, when I give a talk, I start right from questions. Uh, so I want to ask you a question. In your opinion, in your professional opinion, into the best of your knowledge, what is the most, what is the weakest link of security system? Ideas, people. Okay, people. Someone, someone read the transcript. Yeah, the synopsis of the talk. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but I see that no one, no one gave any other options. Yeah. So. Hopefully, not all of us agree, right? So let's, let's do it this way. Everyone, please raise one hand. Just one hand, please raise it. It's easy. It's not too hard. Imagine you're back to school, right? You have a new shiny laptop. Bless you. So now, please, lower your hand. Let's first eliminate the cheaters. Why are you are lowering your hand? No, no, no. Please, please, please keep it up. Keep it up so I can see it. Please lower your hand. It's not that easy. <laughs> lower your hand if you have uh, a degree in behavioral science or applied psychology or anything similar. OK, two people. Now, please lower your hand if you think that uh, there is a component in a typical security system that is more vulnerable, more risky than a human being. So in other words, that human is not the weakest link. OK, and now please lower your hand if you think that the first thing that company should do in order to make its infrastructure more secure is conduct a social, uh, a conduct awareness training for the staff. OK, not so bad. <laughs> so, yeah. Now we can begin. Let me start with the story. Um, about a very young IT guy who one day in 2005 uh, entered the office of his employer just uh, to find an email in his inbox from his ISP that uh, stated that their traffic by the TCP port 22 was filtered temporarily per an abuse report. Uh, this uh, IT guy was me, and uh, at that moment I was pretty surprised. And by surprise, I mean scared to death. Okay. What followed next was my first experience with a forensic investigation. Uh, I tried to learn all this stuff along the way. The logs, the PCAPs, uh, building timelines, all this stuff that now sounds pretty trivial, but then was quite fun to me. So I tracked it to a server, a Linux server, an outdated one in central Ukraine that uh, ran Red Hat and an application for billing long distance calls. So the IT guys there know, knew how to turn it on and turn it off, that's all. And uh, the track broke off there. Uh, and then I started to analyze the compromised host. And uh, after doing all the analysis, I realized that at some point, um, a network worm just entered the OS by guessing, successfully guessing root password. OK, so what do you think it was? Password, right? Not exactly. So after all these years in the industry, I see a history here, right? So there is a drama. Most probably, the guy first started to protect his root account with just password. And then something surprising happened. And he made it password one, and so on. So. Of course, after this fantastic adventure, I couldn't go back. And uh, my sysadmin life pretty much ended. That's how I started in InfoSec. And the uh, first five years, I spent mostly exploring the industry and trying to fit in, right? Finding the way to uh, realize what I should do. And in the end, I thought that uh, pen testing and security consulting is the area where I can 
uh, inflict the most benefit for the largest, largest number of people. Uh, as many here early in my career, I embraced this idea of human being the weakest link. And uh, why, first of all? Because it was articulated from the highest level of authority. Uh, Schneier put it as amateurs hack systems, professionals hack people. Uh, all the other security gurus build their talks, their books, their interviews, essays on the idea that human is inherently and naturally incapable of dealing with uh, cyber threats. So for some time I took this idea and somehow lived with it. But the question that stuck in my head was why? Why does it happen? So I heard other people tell me that, but I didn't understand the uh, mechanics of that. Why do they click all that crap? Why do they open attachments sent by strangers? Why do they allow spying on them? And so on. Much later, I think I found an answer. Um, the trick is that uh, most security issues arise from the places where different technologies meet each other, right? So imagine this, an extreme example. Uh, you have a task at hand to take an old banking application running on a mainframe, and you have to put it on the internet, right? So most, I don't know, maybe, maybe you think that this is a surprising thing to do, but uh, that happened more than a few times, right? So in the end, you will have a bunch of mediation devices, some web services, some web interface if you're lucky or an ugly Java applet, if we're not, right? And because of the differences uh, between how we did computing back in mainframe era and how we do it now, it will definitely create security issues. And uh, by stretching this example uh, to enormous proportions, I can say that the place where human being meets computing Right? The most issues arise and most dramatic security incidents happen. Uh, why? Mostly because computers and people are completely different. Right? They work differently. Computers follow some set of laws, some logic, and people are mostly irrational. But the rationality fits a certain system uh, that is the subject of the large portion of psychology called behavioral science. Right? Uh, and the using the concepts of behavioral science in cybersecurity is normally called how? Social engineering. Okay? So, for some time I practiced the Red Team Craft and I obtained the chance to use social engineering in the real life for pen testing. Uh, this topic carried me away. I started to read everything available. I read both Mitnick's books at that time, I knew the content of Chris Hednick's book before it came out because of extensive listening to his podcast. And uh, Chris, he has a right about inviting cool people to interviews, to the episodes, and uh, they are not directly or even vaguely connected to cybers, uh, but uh, they share their experience and that's how I learned the new areas to extend my knowledge and the new cool people to look up to. Uh, after a few years, I already not only practiced social engineering, I started to understand the underlying principles of influence that drive people and make them do bad things, like reciprocity, commitment, social proof, and so on. I've read vast variety of specific books that specialize deeper into the topic, from Robert Cialdini to Dan Ariely to Paul Ekman, and uh, then I dug even deeper to behavioral economics and even some neurology, psychology of success, happiness, negotiation. So it became like my hard thing beyond security to do. Going through of all this knowledge, it improved me, right? First of all, as social engineer, and second of all, as a human being. So now. I've improved my social skills because living with people becomes much more easier and much more interesting if you know how they work. And the good thing is that you do not necessarily have to disassemble them for that. And one of the best ways to learn something is to try to teach. So I started to give talks, write blogs, 
promote social engineering within security community. And mostly, uh, the slogan was, the motto sounded like more social engineering in pen testing. We have to test technology, processes, and humans. As is in all areas of knowledge, after spending some time learning and practicing, I started to see the bigger picture. So the second question that stuck in my head after why was uh, how can I protect against this stuff? But for that, preaching more social engineering and pen testing didn't really work. Let me tell you how normally a life of social engineering and pen tester works. So you just go to a client and you say, you know, we have to include social engineering into the scope. And the client says, why? Why should we test something we know will break? Okay, so we already know that it will fail miserably and we don't need to test that. So after some time, I just got bored explaining to people that pen test results are not binary. You don't just get the answer whether you can be hacked or not. You get some input data to the improvement of your processes, personnel, and systems. But even after, excuse me, PCI DSS included the requirement of including social engineering to pen tests, it didn't improve much. Don't hack our people. We know you're going to succeed. So what to do next? What other ways should I try? Um, thankfully for me, the answer was someone else's idea. My friend called me and told me that he was recently appointed as ISO in a large national enterprise, and uh, after some time at this role, he decided that, uh, how to say it, not to insult anyone, that the staff required improvement in regard of social engineering threats. So his company operated in a highly competitive environment, if you know what I mean, right? So people were fished daily, were protected by phone daily. Uh, later, a student from the group, he shared an experience and uh, that pretty much summed it up. One Friday, an accountant left the office and uh, placed a bunch of PDF invoices on the desktop just to do that, to submit them first time in the, in, on Monday in the morning, right? And after the weekends, there were almost the same invoices, but with slightly modified payment details. So he proposed me to arrange a awareness training, okay? Yeah, my first reaction was, so we want me to create a remote slideshow with five multiple choice questions in the end. And he said, no, you better take all your offensive experience and uh, combine it to a workshop that you will give to our top managers, executive assistants, sales, front desk, all the people who face the threats and who are the top profile targets in the organization. And teach them how to detect, resist, and react to that stuff. Taking into account that I just started my own small business, I had not many options, and uh, in addition to that, I thought this is a brilliant idea. And uh, the good thing was that I shouldn't have stopped to do that, because, stopped working, I mean, because someone wanted to pay for that, and uh, the sophistication was that before starting to create that course, I had to realize and had to analyze uh, what we are doing wrong to avoid those obstacles. Um, so I did some research, not, not, not really research, but a bunch of interviews with people, with colleagues that uh, do not uh, necessarily share my views on the topic. And uh, uh, long story short, I've come up to uh, some list of strategic policies, strategic obstacles that, that do not allow us to do that right. So first of all, uh, the cybersecurity, the discipline that is mostly about human, yeah, the human problem, is constantly attempted to be resolved by technical means. So, look, all the issues we have, like security vulnerabilities, insecure configurations, users clicking crap, right, they all basically about human behavior. And we are trying to resolve that with technology by antiviruses, firewalls, all that stuff. Uh, 
Maybe, maybe, because we as professionals come from technical areas, from IT and others, so we just see the nails everywhere, and maybe that's not the worst case scenario, right? But maybe we just could consider other ways of doing that. Instead of displacing responsibility. The second thing that makes it difficult is we are trying to isolate users from responsibility for, for their actions, right? So to put the point of decision making of risk treatment as far from users as possible and centralizing it. Basically, concentration, centralization of responsibility is a very general thing, and many, many companies are trying to resolve it too. For example, you know that automotive uh, is trying to reform it to this lean manufacturing thing, right? Software engineering is trying to make everything agile and operations are DevOps now. So maybe we could also try to move responsibility, the point of risk treatment, somehow closer to the human being. And the third thing that makes everything even more difficult is that the InfoSec industry is totally driven by business risk. We want to formulate our uh, security decisions in terms of avoiding loss and getting some benefits, some advantage. We believe that speaking business language makes our attempts to improve security more efficient. Moreover, we, uh, however, we are good uh, at something else. We are helping business tick some checkboxes in the compliance checklist. We spend most of our effort convincing corporate decision makers about what's not good for their company and its security, but what's good for the budget. And apparently, it's logical because that's where the money is. But maybe we should focus instead on the personal risks and the personal threats of people we talk to. Finally, we are not doing much about the so-called weakest link. Remember the questions I've asked in the beginning, right? So the logically, we have to take the weakest link of a system and raise its potential, right? Improve it and reinforce it. Because in this way, we can dramatically and the most effectively increase the security of the system overall, right? You take the worst thing and make it better. But as I said, humans are mostly irrational. So after I arranged these obstacles in the list, I started to figure out how I could complete the task at hand. Reinforce people's ability to face the risk without completely relying on technology by giving them back control and responsibility for their actions and by making security their personal interest. So long story short, I came up with a list of three basic tools, yeah? So this is the result of my personal innovation because I studied all these seemingly in, in unrelated things about technology and people. I combined some knowledge and uh, here you are. The main tools that I want you to try are fear, incentives, and habits. Um, so we basically know, everyone I guess knows how the fear works, right? So you get through some experience, it harms you, and then you try to avoid it in the future. Good thing about our brain is that you don't have to go through all dangerous experiences to learn, right? You, ha you can learn from experiences of, of others, and the most fascinating thing, you can learn from simulated experiences from your own imagination. And uh, the fact is, the fact proven in practice is that human brain does the process of detection, identification, and treating physical threats very, very well. Yeah, the mere fact that we are still on this planet proves that we are doing something right. To memorize things, that you are trying to teach your users, you have to use this ability in a new world. Yeah, so they are good at detecting and protecting themselves from physical threats, but for that they had tens of millions of years of evolution to learn, right? And the internet is here for, I don't know, 50 years, the web. So you can use the same principle in order to teach them better, but for that you will have to use fear, because people memorize better when they are stressed. Of course, you don't have to scare your audience to death, but uh, you have to make it personal. When it's personal, it's scarier, right? 
they will lose the reputation if a Skype worm will infect all of their contacts. They will be raided by police if their PC sees child pornography to the internet. I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to lose, I am not important. These fallacies should be eliminated because people are hacked, not because they are important, but because other people and organizations trust them. Your goal is to make the things appropriately scary, but not a bit scarier, right? How to measure that? That's simple. Uh, insufficiently stressed audience will check Facebook, check Twitter, and don't care about the content. The overstressed audience will just run away. Uh, and sufficiently stressed audience, appropriately stressed, they will ask questions, they will engage into material, they won't go to lunch before you answer all the questions they made, and after they leave the session, we will come to you and ask you, how do you live with all this knowledge? And uh, normally I reply that uh, you get used to it. This brings us to the need for repeating. Our brain is smart. It remembers bad things worse than good things. Not because our memory degrades with time, because the things are rewritten by new impressions. So how to do that and how frequently to do that is up to you. I prefer to fish my clients, uh, of course, with them knowing that, but not knowing the exact time and doing it regularly. Second tool is social incentives. It's not uh, that old that fear evolutionarily, but it's uh, also very effective. It's uh, about exploiting the norms that we as society build with time, right? So um, using these things, these two things, getting ahead of others and getting along with others is slightly more complicated. Using competition is easier because people like to be rewarded, like to be distinguished from the group, so you can just run an internal bug bounty and reward reports about attack attempts, right? Reward phishing attempts, reward strangers caught uh, on premise without a badge, reward confidential printout leftovers, and so on. Uh, and the materiality of reward is not always critical because people want to be distinguished, right? Recognized. You can do a hall of fame and that will work. Using belonging is slightly more complicated because for that you will have to create a, a group of, uh, how I call them, please don't laugh, corporate awareness evangelists, right? You will use the principle of influence and put there three major groups. First, people with formal authority, the top management, will have to be there, like top three levels, or less if you're a smaller company. Second, you will have to put there all InfoSec guys and all IT guys to exploit the expert influence. And third, you will have to put there the so-called social unicorns. Yeah, again, made up term, but I use it. Uh, these are socially hyperactive persons that uh, socialize, hyper-socialize uh, in general, and they do that at work as uh, just another area. So uh, they know everyone in the office, virtually everyone. This means they know the names of their spouses, the ages of their kids, their birth dates, and so on. They spend immense amounts of time next to water coolers around coffee machines, they communicate and they hyper-communicate. So these ones are either a gift or a curse, depending on your agenda, if they're in your team. But for security awareness, they're definitely good. Imagine the situation when such a person gets hacked, either in real life or during a pen test. So the worst thing a company could do here in this point is to fire them, because after the incident, this person is probably the most valuable security awareness asset in your company. Because why? Why? They will tell about it to everyone. They will explain how it happened, what they did wrong, how, how cool the security guys were to explain their mistakes to them, 
and they will say how they will never, never do that again. So you will create this group of, pardon me, thought leaders, right? And everything else, if theory works out, will follow their example. In order to make this change permanent, you will have to use habits. Um, we all have habits. We use habits to automate. Our brain is smart. It doesn't think about what it does most of the time. So we use habits, and they drive us to work. They clean our houses. They cook our meal, and so on. And we do some important things in that time. So the dangerous thing about habits is that we think, we mostly think, that we can get rid of them. We can give them up. But in fact, that's not true because it's not easy to do, first of all. And second of all, it's much easier to replace them or change them. Um, habits can be imagined as if-then clauses with some reward in the end. So let me give you a few examples. Stress eating. If feeling stressed, then go eat a cookie and be rewarded by higher sugar level and better mood. Smoking. If bored, go outside, then go outside and smoke a cigarette and be rewarded by a minute by yourself or a small talk with a fellow smoker. Drinking. If feeling down, go to the bar. Yeah, then go to the bar, find uh, a thankful listener and be rewarded by their attention. Or at least by polite attention of a bartender. These loops of trigger, routine, and reward represent the habits and uh, as such the majority of the things we do in life. Uh, so we just have to identify the bad habits and replace them with good ones. For that, we will need to identify the triggers, the routines, and the reward that the brain seeks in the end. Uh, okay, let's have, let's have some interaction. Let's hear out some bad security habits. Anyone? Excuse me? Leaving the password under the keyboard. How do you, how do you, how do you formulate in terms of if, then, reward. I will give you an example. Uh, if received an email, then open it immediately and be rewarded by zero items in unread folder. Does anyone relate? No new items in inbox. Is it a reward? Something is accomplished. This is how brain works, right? If seeing intriguing subject, like, I don't know, 2018 uh, compensation review plan, right? Be uh, then open it immediately and be rewarded by knowing your boss's salary, okay? Any other ideas? Please. It's a bad practice, but where is the habit behind it? If asked for credentials, then pass them over Skype and be rewarded by the simplicity of this procedure and helping other person, right? So this is one example. Maybe another? Sorry? Not lock the desktop? When the uh, no, you uh, don't lock your workstation when you leave your desk to grab a coffee or so. Okay, so, so when time comes, you leave your desktop yeah, and not take control. lock it and be rewarded by shorter times of getting to the call, right? Yeah. Okay, so you get it, right? So uh, these are some very typical uh, habits, right? And uh, we already discussed the reward, so if you run a bug bounty, you will have a reward for the habits you create. Uh, and routines have to be changed, for example, to something, I don't know, do not click it immediately, but think about it, or freeze, or uh, proceed with caution, right? So these are things that need to be taught. But the most important thing in, in these habits is the trigger, because if you don't identify it, you cannot apply the routine and 
reward as a result. So uh, when I train people, I normally give them some example triggers and then they feed me with some examples from their experience. So in this way, I trick people to give away the materials for such talks and my trainings, right? I ha always have the database of uh, actual triggers. Uh, and each formula of such trigger, it can be, it can be analyzed and uh, uh, disassembled to three major components. So first, there is a method of social engineering attack, right? Such as phishing email, impersonation, elicitation, pretexting over the phone, software exploits, baiting with USB thumb drives, and so on. So there is a method of attack. Second, there is an influence principle from psychology. First one from tech, second from psychology. Influence principle, to know our urgency, reciprocity, social proof, authority, liking, commitment, and so on. And then there is a security context. Basically anything of importance in personal sense or in corporate sense, right? So these are some popular examples. Let's go through them if we have time. How much time do we have left? 25 minutes. What should we do? I'm always finished. So uh, <laughs> these are examples of triggers. Let's look at. So email could be a type of attack. Urgency is definitely the influence principle because we start doing things faster and don't think about it. And the uh, confidential data that is asked to be provided is definitely within some business context, right? You meet a person, some person you didn't see for a long time, an old, uh, an old schoolmate that you don't remember, obviously, but he says that that's okay. And for, by being polite, you just accept that idea. And he just meets you in the street and asks you not about how many kids you have and uh, please show me the photo of your wife, but starts to ask you about some security stuff, some business security context, right? What you do at your current job. Uh, and uh, I don't know, attractive, likable human, preferably of uh, an opposite sex, right? Or whatever you like. And it's he or she is asking you to take part in some activity, an interview, and then award you with a USB drive that you are supposed to later insert to your corporate PC. So, of course, to identify these triggers, yeah, the people that you train have to know these types of modern cyber, cyber attacks, these types of influence principles, and uh, most importantly, what to do when they spot such situations. When you train them for enough time, they become ready to embrace the universal formula that they will use further in the future to identify such situations which is something like this. So you have the signs of potential type of attack, you have the signs of use of, a, of an influence principle on in you, and you observe it in some kind of security context, which means that they are talking or they are asking or they are uh, trying to touch or enter something of value to you. So as simple as that. Of course, it's just the knowledge, that's the theory. And in order for that to become a skill, uh, a habit even, you will have to make them practice, right? And uh, you will need a lot of examples like this, but my experience tells me that uh, that's the most fun part of the training. As long as we have some time, I will give you one more tool. Uh, there are plenty of sources of awareness material in the popular culture, right? Even though we as security professionals may find them of inappropriate precision, right? So, uh, for example, in my opinion, the first season of Mr. Robot made for security awareness more than the whole InfoSec industry so far. At least I could show it to my parents and not be ashamed of it for the first time in my life when it comes to a series about hackers. Okay, uh, the real hustle is good showing uh, con artist tricks and basic social engineering. They can use after that against each other and even doing some reverse social engineering tricks against the people who are trying to attack them. 
Tiger Team gives an idea of how red teaming exercises look like. Lie to me is quite okay to see how general expressions and emotions work as long as you read Dr. Paul Ekman's devastating comments to each episode. What was true, what was not. So if you have uh, a favorite book or a movie or a series about cybers, yeah, you don't hold it to yourself, you give it away. Let them see what we do for a living. We still have some time, yeah? Okay, so I will share, you, I will share with you some perfect security awareness improvement that I observed only once so far in my life, right? So we had this client who ordered the full package, the initial pen test, then the trainings, and then the retest to see how it works, to measure the change. Uh, in fact, it wasn't like that. They started by requesting only the initial pen test, but the results were so devastating, so they decided to go all in. And uh, as said, his initial pen test report looked to them as promising it looked to us, right? So I will skip <laughs> what we did and how we did it, not to sound like an ad, but just two things that uh, impressed me the most during these sessions. We had two groups, one group uh, during one day of training and then two weeks for me to recover my voice and then another group with another session. So first thing that impressed me was the reaction to the slide showing all their passwords. Yeah, so they sit and look at that. Normally it just lies down into some, uh, into some folder with a pen test report and the people who were hacked do not see it, right? Only management has access to confidential report on pen testing. But in this case they saw their passwords and it goes like this. First they, in panic, are looking for theirs. Right? They are hoping that that's not in there. Then they find it, yeah? And this is like the expression of ultimate despair. Then in a few seconds they calm down and start reading others' passwords. And after that they look at each other and they start laughing hysterically for a few minutes. You can't stop it, okay? So this really works. The stress, the understanding of, oh my God, how can I be so stupid? And then seeing that everyone is like that. There is no weakness in that. There is just vulnerability that rises from we don't know. And the second thing is uh, when the second group came after two weeks, they already have been half through the books that we recommended for, to the first group. They were the fans of Mr. Robot. <laughs> they were subscribed to my page on Facebook, to my company's page, to my blog. They visited, attended our online webinars, so they started to transform the corporate culture without our help beforehand. And they asked me, <laughs> most of the time they just spent on asking me about the validity of techniques depicted in Mr. Robot. You know, was it true there? Was it correct there? Is it possible? Is it not? And so on. The people who were working in the company that does not have any relation to IT or security. And although the retest, when it came eight months later, uh, was quite a positive experience, uh, I cannot say that we did not hack them at all, right? So it happened, but of all people, only one took the bait, and it was her last day on this job. And she told me, looking into my eyes, that she was 100, she had the check already, right? So this was literally her last day. Not because of this, this, it was planned. So she looked at me and told me, smiling, that uh, she was 100% sure that that was us, and she tried to have some fun, okay? so. Although that wasn't the normal straight up to domain admin experience, right? It still gave me some input data uh, and showed me that, yeah, there are facets of human behavior that still require further research. So this is my story so far, okay? Maybe because I've been hacked in the very beginning, it allowed me to avoid this temptation to blame the user all my life and try to find the ways to make them stronger. That's what I'm asking you to do, too, okay? Users aren't dumb. 
They just don't know. This is why humans are, in fact, the weakest security link by default. And this is how you can change their settings. Don't under underestimate humans, especially scared ones with the right habits and good social incentives. Give them a chance and uh, I assure you they will surprise you. Thank you. Here I have uh, some materials, some additional ones. So this is like a thing we are trying to come up to, right? A manual for an average person that is not IT guy or security guy, how to stay safe online. Its code name is don't click shit. Uh, in favor of uh, the talk of the same name but jaded security a long time ago. And this is key base, that's how you can contact me. If there are any questions, I will be happy to try to answer.